from the very beginning of the time that I started weaving my way through the tubes that build the nets, <laughs> I've been an admirer of this organization, especially its founders. I was incredibly honored to be able to serve on its board, and I'm incredibly happy to be able to be here to celebrate these pioneers. Because in the tradition of 22 years of these awards, there's been an incredible list of pioneers honored by this organization. From Doug Henry Bart, and Sir Dabal Khan, to Whit Duff Diffie, to Phil Zimmerman, to Torvald and Stallman. These were all people who, at the time, could be recognized as the people who pointed us forward. But as I thought about the job of celebrating the pioneers we're talking about tonight, I began to wonder, are we talking about pioneers? Jamie Love, who has spent a lifetime demanding that when the government hands out monopolies of many different forms, the question that they need to prove is that these monopolies make sense, because when they don't, what they do is block access to people who need drugs or information shouldn't block access. Glenn Greenwald and Laura Bunchress have been holding the government accountable and defending those who would hold the government accountable against extraordinary pressures and risks. And Aaron, in everything he did, worked to make democracy better, to code, to build activism with a certain courage inspired literally millions around the world. These are great souls. These are heroes of mine. But are they pioneers? They don't point us forward, these people. They point backwards. They're not pointing us to something new. They're pointing us to something I thought we already knew. Not so much pioneers as citizens, citizens with simple courage to stand for something that should be obvious, but isn't obvious now. Citizens. At a time when just to be a citizen is to be a pioneer. Now what's troubling right now is how lonely these acts of courage are. How lonely it is to live the life that celebrates these acts, politically lonely. In a democracy, if there are two sides or three sides, many sides, all sides have their represented voice, and in the political process, one side wins, our party, their party. And in the regular battle for which side wins, the question is, when you get in power to assert your views and win. But for these citizens, there is no party. There is no side that's on our side. There are exceptions, of course, outliers, but not mainstream members of either of the two political parties. Jamie has Bernie Sanders. I'm not sure if Glenn and Laura have anybody. Aaron had Wyden and Gerald Issa, but these are outsiders, the fringe. Mainstream, and the work of these people as crazy. The mainstream looks at the obvious and calls it nuts. Now, this is the hardest thing for me. This organization was started by pioneers by Radical, Barlow, Capor, Gilmore. They are not me, or I'm not them. I'm the furthest from a radical you could be. I'm normal, boring, as boring as you could possibly be, right in the middle, as much as you can imagine, I'm not them. So it's enormously frustrating, scary, almost, to find myself in this position where the obvious to me is crazy, to the mainstream, where the sensible is viewed as senseless, to the mainstream. Because how is it that this demand that monopolists justify their monopolies, Jamie's work, is not obvious to all? How is it that a people raised in a culture to idolize Ellsberg doesn't recognize Ellsberg and his defenders, Glenn and Laura, when they're among us? How is it that a people, and 
exceptional nation, we are told. Send me the inheritors of the Enlightenment, prosecute and threaten with 35 years in jail a boy whose only crime was to spread knowledge. Knowledge. Not Britney Spears, not Madonna, not even the band Phoenix. Knowledge. <laughs> Academic knowledge. Scientific knowledge, medical knowledge, to spread it broadly. How did we get to this place? Where these most American ideas are un-American. How did we allow this most un-American spirit to rule? I was an admirer of all four of these pioneers, these citizens. But it breaks my heart to live in a time when their acts stand out, when this is bravery. When saying obvious truths makes you a pioneer, breaks my heart. And maybe the truth is my heart is already broken. It was broken. It was broken eight months ago. Eight months ago, when one of his friends called me to say, Aaron, Aaron is dead. There's not a single day since that call, that I've not thought about that boy dying. There's not a single day I haven't thought how we, his people, our fights, brought him to this end. There are many of us here who knew that boy. His impish brilliance. We were here. We were tested by his questions, questions, his demands to explain, to justify why we believed what we believed and why we did what we did. And every one of us failed that test, failed his test. But sometime in our experience, in our relationship, we failed his test. But what's hard is not that each of us failed. What's hard is that all of us failed. That all of us failed these our ideals. Last month, MIT issued a report about the events leading up to the death of Aaron Swartz. It was striking to me were the ideals in this report. Ideals they recognized and then recognized as breached. For example, the core of the government's case was the claim that Aaron's access was unauthorized. But the report made it clear that inside of MIT, bubbling up to the top, was a nagging question. Because, in fact, according to the rules of MIT, his access was authorized. Joey Ito wrote an email to the president of MIT saying, shouldn't we tell the prosecutors that the whole premise of their case is false? That under our rules, what he did was authorized. He can't be a criminal if it was authorized. Shouldn't we tell them? But they didn't. They didn't because they had faith. The government would figure it out. That was their idea. But the government didn't. And the prosecution continued as if the truth didn't matter. The government. Our government. This, our government, did. For another point, the most striking thing to me about this report is its account of the prosecutor's explanation to MIT about why it was doing this, the government, why it was doing this. Why make an example here? Why make this an extreme case? Why not just simply settle it for the modest infraction if it was an infraction that objectively was? And the reason was not the government's fear that Aaron was some terrorist, or a cracker, or even a pornographer. That was not their fear. The reason, the justification, is that this was an American who objected. As the Huffington Post wrote, MIT's report indicates Hyman, the prosecutor, was angry that Schwartz had started what Hyman called a, quote, wild 
internet campaign, end quote, against his prosecution. Hyman said Schwartz's actions were foolish and took the case to an institutional level. So here, in America, a federal prosecutor believes it's appropriate to increase the penalty, increase the punishment, because someone has the temerity to object. Because someone criticizes him and the government. Here, in America. And in America, an attorney general, a democratic attorney general, reviews all this, says it's fine, appropriate, justified. Here, in America. And in America, a president, a democratic president, accepts that review and does nothing in response to set anything differently. Because that is the view of what is appropriate today. Well, I sometimes think, and I try to understand that sometimes, sometimes, maybe all the time, when I all the time try to think, understand why, why he did it, why Aaron did it, why this citizen, this pioneer, took his life, I sometimes think it was this, this recognition. That his world would be destroyed because of this, because that meant that they, that we, that this government had fallen so incredibly far, that it, that we, that we would do this. And that that was too much. We all knew his disappointment, small disappointments in us, even the best of us. But this disappointment, this disappointment was too profound. This disappointment was too great. Because in his heart, the truth was, Aaron was an idealist. And these truths about us broke his heart. And then he broke ours. I dream of a time when simple acts of citizenship aren't called brave. Or to have the courage to be a citizen doesn't make you a pioneer. When we have a political system where the right is on at least one side, or where right is on both sides, and where we, organizations like this, can get back to the luxury of tiny fights. I mean, they're big fights. But they're big fights over tiny issues, at least against the background of the issues that we face now. Remember the old days when we could worry about neutral networks, or whether culture could get remixed, or whether Mickey Mouse should be set free. Remember those days? <laughs> I dream of a time when we can get away from this time, when we have to fight monopolists to get their drugs to people who need them. We fight governments for the right to criticize. Fight the hopelessness that leads one to take his life. Celebrate these pioneers, these citizens, Jamie and Glenn and Laura, and the sweet soul of his family. Their work is not done, but it's simple work. It's the work of citizens. It will never be done. Let us continue.